All right. Welcome back to part two of our interview with <laughs> Julian Vanderbilty. Uh, we have, it's not his fault. We have technical difficulties sometimes. Everybody does. That's the world we live in with streaming. I mean, this stuff happens whether we like it or not. So, But we're relentless, and we're going to stick with it. I don't know if you remember what you were talking about when we left. Oh, I remember there. talking about puking. That's, I think that's the last thing I remember is just okay. uh, talking about running and throwing up and just being completely overwhelmed by how how regimented everything was and how professional everything was, uh, you know, at Iowa. Tell me about those shakes a little bit, because I, I, I like to ask everybody about those shakes are kind of famous now to help you guys put on weight. Were, did they ever have you drinking those shakes or was that something you were able to avoid? No, I was I was too heavy. I came in. Remember, I thought I was gray shirting. So. Okay. My understanding of my situation was um, was that I was going to come in after the season at the start of the of, uh, of the spring semester, uh, and then I was going to have essentially that whole year where I was going to work out with the team and be a part time student, or at least work out on campus to be a part time student, uh, and then come in the following camp. So when whatever it was, like a week or or three days into camp or something like that. Uh, somebody got hurt and they called me up and said, hey, we're taking you off of gray shirt. We're going to put, put you on a red shirt and we're going to bring you in. I was 30 pounds overweight uh, and had not expected to do anything. So I was I had not been actively working out at the time. Oh. Uh, enjoying summer break, right? Uh, yeah. Went on a trip and was you know getting ready to, to, to hang out for the fall and, and be a part-time student. And uh, and so I was in no way, shape, or form prepared. I think my first three weeks, I literally ate nothing but grilled chicken breast and lettuce. That was oh. pretty it. Um, but they got me down to two ninety five in like three weeks, and uh, and that I played at that for you know the next ten years. Wow, jeez, that was. Uh, I bet your stomach was was it just waking you up at night saying like, hook me <sighs> up with a snack, man. It was so bad, and that was, I mean, to come from a program where we really, you know, where we had, you know, some morning workouts, but that was more like, because I was, I was a wrestler, too, to come to this where it was, you know, you wake up at five to be in, you know, in the in Iowa in winter and run, you know, and jog through the snow to get to the, uh, you know, to the football complex, um, you know, for a, for a 6 a.m. workout, uh, you know, on, on no, on nothing in the stomach, uh, you know, I was, Basically, on sheer willpower alone, it was like, no, I have dreamt of being a, a Hawkeye my entire life. I'm not going to let this opportunity go by. Whatever they ask me to do, I'm just going to, uh, you know, head down, mouth shut, and let's just do it. So it was tough, but it was, uh, I think it was necessary, especially for me. I'm a, you're a pretty smart guy, so I'm going to ask you some questions that make you, make you think a little bit. So certain <laughs> ones we we just like ask very very detailed questions, and you know guys like you that are thinkers and intellectuals, I like to just get, give a little bit of a topic and let you run with it because uh, oh boy. You, you got some good stories. But uh, you know you talked about some of the highlights of Iowa football briefly over the years during your time as a Hawkeye. What would you say would be your top maybe one or two moments that you look back on and you're like that. That was that was one of the greatest moments of my Iowa Hawkeye career. That was amazing. Um, the first one I think is up the kick against Penn State. Um, you know that that game, them coming in undefeated, right, chasing Joe Pa's next national championship, yada yada. Um, you know, and and Sean Green. That whole year was so fun blocking. Yeah. Um, and I still I still don't know how that, it's like the fumble on the first defense or when our when our defense was out there and it was like their first offensive drive. That's a touchdown for us, but I digress. The uh, the fact that we won the game at the end is the important thing. But I mean the atmosphere in Kinnick that night was unlike anything I've ever experienced since. To have the you know the the fans all in black within the student section in green, which is something which is you know we had never done, and, and I don't know if it's ever going to be done again. But uh, you know, from start to finish, how electric that game was, um, and just feeling the momentum and the shift, and knowing there were certain games where you just you just knew by like the way that you were playing as a team and the and the situation, you could just feel yourself like. We're not losing this game. There's no way on God's green earth we are losing this game, and that was one of those. And so for it to come down to just the end and have uh, you know and have Murphy drill that uh, that kick, um, you know, especially like me and Kyle Callaway, RIP, you know, being there in the field goal, and it's like we're on the left hand side and we're kicking from the right hash, so they've got like the six biggest guys that Penn State could muster 
trying to knock just the two of us, you know, backwards into this kick and having to hold up on, uh, you know, on that moment. Um, that's, I remember that game forever. Uh, really that whole, I mean, that whole season and the next season, especially playing against our defense, as dominant as they were, those were just fun, fun times. Um, and the other one that might surprise you is, uh, so the Orange Bowl, um, I knew we were going to win that game before we ever played it. Uh, and we knew that, I knew that when we went to uh, Bush Gardens. Uh, there, um, not Bush Gardens. Uh, yeah, it was, or, so it wasn't the Orange Bowl season. I'm sorry, it was the year before that. Um, so the Sean Green season, we went to Bush Gardens down in Tampa uh, for the Outback Bowl, and we had, to, we had like the, the time when we had the snake. Uh, so like me and Mike Daniels put a, okay. put a, you know, a, a boa constrictor on our shoulders, and uh, there's a picture of me like having a flamingo eating off of my head, basically. And, like, we're all in there, right? Just these, you know, country kids from Iowa and dudes from New Jersey and just this kind of amalgamation of, uh, you know, guides. And we're in the animal pens and we're having a good time and doing all this stuff. And the South Carolina players, all these, you know, six foot seven, six foot eight, just, you know, 350 pound monsters, uh, you know, SEC pride and all this thing and, you know, all that. They wouldn't even get in the animal pen with the flamingos. They were like, "No, man, I don't mess with birds, man. I don't." And I was just like, "You don't mess with, you don't mess with birds. It's a flamingo. We're the Hawkeyes. Like, we are going to absolutely shred you." And no. it was, there was like a mentality that was different between us and them. Um, and I knew and that was one of those games where I knew going into it as soon as that whole thing transpired, I was like, "We are mentally better or different than them, um, and we are going to win this game." Oh, that's a that's a really cool story. That's interesting. I mean, you just felt like you had that mental edge already. You're like, we're tougher than these guys. We're going to put it to them, and you know, we're a lot more resilient than they are. And that's one of the great things about being a Hawkeye is they build that resiliency in the weight room and in practice. That you know, I think that's probably why they call it the Iowa Edge. You know, we've talked about that quite a bit of times. That it gives you a little bit of a leg up because you're outworking people, and you just got that confidence that you got the grit that some yes. of those other guys don't um, so talk, tell us about some guys that have grit, like some of the guys that you went against in practice that, you know, maybe you didn't even go against that were just animals that uh, on a daily basis, at times you pull yourself back, but like, gosh, that guy is freaking <laughs> amazing. Like this just, just like it kind of blew your mind watching them play. I mean, that, that I think was the best part about playing at Iowa was especially when I was playing there was you had guys like Matt Kroll, and Mitch King and Carl Klug and Mike Daniels and Christian Ballard and all, you know, and the, I mean, that's just, you know, the guys that are lining up across from us and then behind them, you've got like Pat Anger and Humple and all these guys who are just, I mean, the best, right? Those defenses were so insane. Uh, and to go against those guys day in and day out in practice um, was way harder than any game, uh, you know, that you could possibly play in. Um, Cause there was like, they, they knew how good they were and norm and the attitude that he instilled in those defenses uh, like every single practice was a game for them so they came for your head uh, and you had to be on your game every single play I mean Mitch King was so quick for a guy his size um, I still don't think to this day I don't think I've ever actually touched Pat Anger um, you know, you'd get up to the secondary and, and go to block him and he'd be like right there and you'd have him squared up and then you'd go to hit him and he was just gone um, so, I mean, they were, you know, and Matt Kroll was the toughest son of a gun ever. I mean, you, you can literally go across the, the board. I don't think there was a person on that started on those defensive lines that I had to try and block uh, that was not at the top of their game and was not better than anyone that I went against in, uh, in actual game scenarios. So those front sevens were just brutal. What kind of teammate was Pat Anger? We just had him on just recently, and he's one of my all-time favorite Hawkeyes just because of, you know, like we talked about the grit, the determination, and the guy is just, you know, a fireball. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of teammate was he? He was great. Um, he, was, he, was, he was odd in a wonderful way. Um, you know, he was the guy who would who'd mess with you. You'd get out of the shower, and he'd come over and just – like nothing was wrong, just put his leg up on the, you know, on the on the stool next to you, uh, you know, just start naked and start having a conversation. <laughs> like, are you trying to get in my head? Like I'm not the opponent. You don't have to psych me out, dude. Um, but no, he had a little like all of the truly great linebackers. He he's a little unhinged, right? He was just a yeah. little off, um, and it was terrifying. 
Uh, and for him, I'm just, it, it was one of those things where every day you woke up and you're like, thank God this guy's on my side, right? Yeah. So if he was on the other side, I would be in so much trouble. Is there any sort of cool stories that happen in practice or in the in the weight room with your teammates that like just a regular fan watching in the stands would love to hear about that had never never heard it? Maybe you know maybe sometimes you're sitting there working in the office and it just pops into your head and you're like oh god that was hilarious like that was really cool like Tyler Kluver told a story about how they were looking for one of their teammates and he wandered into the uh, the computer lab and forgot about a paper he had to write and he was sitting there stark naked writing a <laughs> writing a paper in the computer you're like completely naked i mean they uh i've heard a lot of them cole fisher told a really good one about how kirk like right around thanksgiving they were he was pissed off at him because they weren't mm -hmm. practicing very hard and he looked at him and he said f you happy thanksgiving and then walked off <laughs> and walked off the field and they were all just like whoa like he actually mm -hmm. said the word but you know, i, I kind of you know refrain on that did you, you guys ever have because you had a cast of characters on your team when you guys were there, including yourself, you have to have a couple pretty great stories of things that happened. It, it took a lot to kind of shake me out of my focus because I was always, I, like I said, I didn't, I never truly felt like I really belonged there um, because I was like, these guys are, are superheroes and I'm this fat nerd from Davenport. Uh, you know, like, what am I doing here? So, like, my I constantly had blinders on. It was just like head down, mouth shut, do your job. Head down, mouth shut, do your job. The ones that all that would like kind of break me out of that were when like fights would break out. Um, it was because it was so rare, but you could always kind of tell it was coming. Right, the the atmosphere like you'd get towards camp and it'd be like week two of camp and we've been smacking each other in the face for you know a week. And this guy and this guy have spent the last 12 hours at each other's throats. They don't look at each other off the field. They don't talk to each other. Like, we're about to get into nine on seven. Here it comes. Uh, you know, and sure enough, that you know, they bang heads together. And I forget who. I think I saw my freshman year, like, I'm pretty sure it was Marshall Yonder ripped somebody's face mask off. It might have been Kenny wow. or something like that. I think it was Yonder and Webber. Uh, and they got into it. And... That was just one of those like, what just happened moments? Because you don't you don't punch a guy right. He's wearing a face mask. So what did Yana do? He just reached out, grabbed the face mask, and boom, took it right off the helmet. Oh. So that like stuff like that, I I remember um, you know from practice. But it's it's one of those where it's just like, oh, it's oh oh it's happening. Oh, it's happening. <laughs> it's like, do I jump in? Do I not jump in? Like especially for me, I'm like I'm a freshman. I'm not getting anywhere near this. But uh, you tried to you tried to log some of those. That's that's raw power right there. Yeah. That's insane. He was brutal. Yeah, no, I'm so glad I got just even if it was just for one year to see him like live because he was just such a on a completely other level uh, work ethic. I mean, raw power. The guy with, he was he was tremendous to watch. And he laid that nasty block on that Iowa State mm -hmm. player. That was sickening. We tailgated with. Yeah, yeah, I mean, could have been, could have been. Hey, I was, um, I, the, I, I was like a game, call, game or two after that, we were tailgating, and we just happened to tailgate next to his family, and um, I, I believe it was his sister. She was super cool, like a lot of fun to hang out with, and she was like, yeah, we got um, NFL like agents blowing up the phones now trying to talk to them <laughs> after that block, mm -hmm. and, and they were like, they were, you know, it was – you know, things were brewing a little bit for him before that. But then as soon as he laid that block, all of a sudden it's like everybody wanted him. Like yep. that guy ran into a brick wall named Yonda. It was, <laughs> it was sickening. So I, I don't know. This might be a record that you are very proud of. It might be a record that you're not so proud of. I'd be proud of it. I'd own it. And I have a feeling you do. Is it true that you hold the record in the NFL for being cut the most times? Oh yeah. By the, and I think it's, I don't think it's total, and I, I do. I, I own this record, and I love it. Um, I have the most transactions with a single team. I think it's okay. like a, I have 21 or 23. I can't remember if it's an odd number. 21. Um, yeah, 21 transactions with the Eagles. So whether it was being signed, being cut, being put on practice squad, signed from practice squad, cut, whatever it was, 21 individual transactions with them. I think it's cool, and they still, to this day, like every now and then, if somebody gets cut uh, and re-signed from the Eagles like five or six times, 
my Twitter will blow up like, oh, this guy's the next Bat Vandervelde, you know, the next Julian Vandervelde, whatever. And uh, and I just get on there. And I'm like, listen, you got to hit at least double digits before we're going to let you into the cut and resign club. It's like me, Emmanuel Acho, and everybody else can can suck it. What were the ups and downs like of that? At that, I always see that like on Hard Knocks, where you, they just let guys go that have you bled and sweat, blood, sweat, and tears all over the field, and they just bring them in and, and they cut them. And the guys are just professional about it. Like, okay, thanks for the opportunity, and they walk out. I'd be like, God, if that was me, I'd be like flipping a table over and, and pissed off. <laughs> like, you know, this is this is bullshit. And you know, you went through it so many times. Like, what was that emotional roller coaster like for you? Yeah, it was a little different at the beginning because um, my rookie my rookie year, uh, I I was still kind of trying to catch up to the NFL. Um, you know, it took me about I don't know, I was maybe two weeks into the season before I really caught the tempo or right? I got that that speed upgrade that you have to play at up there. And so going into my second year, there was just so much chaos surrounding the team with kind of what was happening with Andy and what was happening with the team and everything. Um, and, and so when I was released, I was like, okay, that's fine. I'm going to go somewhere else and, and do my thing. And when they brought me back, it was kind of like, okay, cool. Um, my, after I blew my back out, I kind of knew what, what was, uh, what was going to happen. Um, you know, as far as the rehabilitation, you know, coming back to the team, trying to get back involved in it. Um, and that final season when, I don't know. That was when like 17 of the 21 transactions or something happened in the same year. That year, I pretty much knew what my what my place was. So for me, like that team mentality of everybody has a place and everybody has a job and all. And if you you do your job to help the team, my part of the team at that point was to be the the 53rd guy on the roster to be the one when if starting uh, linebacker rolled his ankle and they had to bring somebody in for two weeks, they let me know like, Hey, we're going to cut you for the next two weeks. We got to bring somebody in to replace so-and-so he's going to be, you know, once uh, he's healthy and back, uh, you know, with us, then we're going to bring you back in and, you know, and cut this other guy that we brought in to replace him. And it was just kind of this revolving thing where I knew what the situation was. So I knew what to expect. And it really wasn't that insane of a thing. They'd just bring me in and be like, Hey, we got to cut you this week. We'll bring you back next week. Or, Hey, we got to cut you this week. We'll bring you back in two weeks. Um, so it was, you know, it wasn't like a part-time gig, but it was a pretty week to week sort of thing. Um, and I got kind of used to that. Um, so for me, it was more of a professional thing. You know, it wasn't really a table flipping sort of deal. Um, the last one surprised me, but outside of that, I was just kind of like, yeah, this is this is what I'm here to do on this team right now is to be the guy who, who when I'm around, and they would tell me this, like, we, we like your work ethic, we like your attitude, like, you make everybody around you better, so we want you a part of the team. But it's like, I couldn't, at that point, I was, you know, I had lost, I don't know, 50% of my quickness for my back injury. It was just like, I couldn't compete at that level anymore. So I was a guy who was there to, to bring everybody up when I was around, but who could, who had the freedom and the flexibility um, to just kind of be a guy that you could sideline and then bring back. And I just saw that as my role. For those, for those of us that don't know, the pay structure wise, when you're getting cut and going back and forth like that, how does that work? Are you still on the payroll when you get cut or is it just back and forth? How, how does that type of thing work? Do you have to renegotiate a contract every time? No, it's pretty much weekly. So there's there's kind of this perception because everybody sees these massive, massive, massive contracts that everybody in the NFL makes, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And it's just not the case. Um, you know, you uh, unless you are an established guy who has a long term contract signing bonuses, uh, you know, if you're an established starter, uh, you know, those guys have pretty secure contracts. Where it's like, OK, this team has made an investment in you. So now they have to honor that investment or they have to get their money's worth out of that investment. So they're going to keep you around and play you and yada, yada, yada. For those of us who are not in that starting 22, really, you are on a week to week basis where you effectively have a contract that says we can cut you for any reason at any time because you are not living up to like team expectations or whatever the exact verb is. So you're paid in the NFL based on that week. And it's if you are on the roster on a certain day of the week, they have to pay you for that week. And I think it's Thursday, if I'm not mistaken, unless that's changed. Okay. So there's a day of the week, and if you're on the on the roster on that day of the week, they have to they have to pay you. Uh, and if you're not on the roster that week, then you just don't get paid. 
So that was kind of what it was, was I was on this, you know, minimum uh, contract where basically it was if I was on the roster for that week, I would get a paycheck after the game. If I was cut that week, then I would just go back to the uh, or to my uh, uh, apartment and just hang out. Um, so it's don't get me wrong, it's not bad pay, it's not great, but it's enough that you know, two weeks off, I wasn't sweating it. Okay, I'm interested to know what it was like to play for Andy Reid, what type of guy he was, because he seems like a pretty fantastic guy, and mm-hmm. with him coaching team the locker room atmosphere for the eagles especially how does that compare to a to a college locker room like at the university of iowa it was it was kind of the perfect dichotomy between andy and chip because chip was a college guy uh and he brought that exact same atmosphere to the nfl um to the eagles locker room and andy was not andy was a was an nfl guy who's an nfl veteran coach and so you had this very like I'm I'm a little disappointed that I got Andy in those last two years with with Philadelphia, and everything was kind of funky, uh, you know, during that time period with him and with the team, um, and everybody knew going into the last season, like the players were talking about it, like there's no way he makes it through the end of the season, you know, they're you know looking for the next person, da da da, um, but Andy was very much so. You are professionals, and you are here to do a job. You've gotten to this point because you know how to optimize yourself. So like the lifts were pretty open as far as when you could come in and how much you had to do. Um, practice was a lot more laid back. Um, he's a brilliant, brilliant like mind. So his playbook was you know this thick, um, and and there was a lot of like cool stuff with the offense. But he himself was pretty hands off, and the and the staff kind of reflected that. It was like you were professionals, do your job and make yourself ready to play. Was basically what it was. Uh, Chip was the exact opposite. Chip was a micromanager to the nth degree. Uh, so, like, like Iowa had, you know, was pretty strict and stringent with you. Chip was infinitely more so. Oh. Uh, it did not jive. I mean, I remember Jason Kelsey storming out of like the fourth workout that we had. We were like in their indoor facility running sprints, and we'd just done I don't know like a tenth or twelfth gas or something like that, and. Jason loses his ever-loving mind, just I mean, screaming at the at the uh, the strength and conditioning guys who come from Nebraska of all places. Just F and BS. You can't treat us like that, that college freshman. I'm a professional. You can't treat us like this. Like we don't know what we're doing. Blah, 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 just walks off the field. Wow. And this whole staff of college coaches who have probably never been talked to like that before are just kind of like. Uh, like, okay, work workouts over, I guess, and that was like the end of it. Um, like, it's a very, very different atmosphere, and and that mentality didn't really work there. Well, and it makes sense why it doesn't. You know, they're grown men, and they've gotten to the point in their lives where you got to you know manage and monitor yourself a little bit. You're paying mm-hmm. most, a lot of these guys millions of dollars to to be there. You can't micromanage them and watch over every little thing they do. But uh, one thing that um. I always heard that Andy Reid used to watch over was the team menu, what you guys would have for <laughs> meals. And yeah. I, always, yeah. I always heard that there was like, um, and I don't know if this is true, but like a fast food Tuesday or something like that, where the, he would like cater in all kinds of fast food from different places. I don't know if that's an embellished story or tell us about what the meal plans were like when Coach Reid was there. It was very, very slightly embellished, not okay. embellished. Any insane capacity. It's very close. Now we wouldn't do we wouldn't do like actual fast food, um, like from a fast food place. But yeah, there was um, you know if after after the games, really before the games too, but mainly after the games, like the training table would not be you know steak and chicken and brown rice and all these other things that you would have in a normal training table scenario. Um, you know that it was chicken fingers and French fries and cheeseburgers. Um, like it was, it was quote unquote junk food. Um, but you also have to remember it's being made out of like top tier ingredients by, you know, NFL facility chefs. So there was, it was a little better than the stuff you'd, you know, get in the drive through. That's still awesome though. I I loved hearing that story. I'm like, what a guy. Uh, And of course they pull everything they can out of the woodwork when you, you know, got let go from the Eagles. They're like, yeah, his his nutritional plan for the players was like so poor. Like he had fast food Tuesdays and all this stuff like that. It's like, oh man, does he really do you didn't that? Have to eat there though. That's the thing. You didn't have to like eat that stuff. And that was again, that was part of his thing. Was like the pregame speech. 
every pregame speech that he ever gave the night before in the hotel room ended the exact same way. All right, let's go get a cheeseburger. That was his like, that was his wrap up to every meeting was, all right, let's go get a cheeseburger. And he was the first one out of that room to go get himself a cheeseburger. That was Um, Andy. Speaking of head coaches too, with with Kirk, with your relationship with him and knowing um, him a, as you as you did playing for him all that time, I uh, I remember a post game speech and it was after a big win and it was during your time there. I can't remember specifically what game, but uh, the reporter asked him. She said, "All right, coach, you know it was a huge win. How are you going to go celebrate this?" And he said, um, "I'm going to go have some of I- a bowl of Iowa's own Wells Blue Bunny ice cream. It's delicious." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like. Really? Because I most coaches I know are gonna go home and make a stiff drink and you know, maybe watch a film or something like that. Uh, is he you know, I I love Kirk. We all love Kirk, you know, like he is one of the greatest coaches in the country and one of the most well respected. But tell me that he's got a little more edge to him than what he a lot of times conveys in press conferences. It's hard to say that because he really, that was the thing I think that I, one of the things that I love most about Kirk is that he's consistent. Like what you see in press conferences, that's just him. He's like that. Every now and then, like to your point with the Thanksgiving story, right? Every now and then something will set him off, right? If he knows that we've had a bad week of practice, you know, he'll lay into you a little bit at the end of the day. Um, you know, if he if we had a really bad game, uh, you know, and he feels like it's necessary, he might lay into it a little bit before we watch the film. But he is even keel and he is consistent as they come. Uh, and so really, yeah, what what you see outside is really the way that he is. He's he's to the point and he's very direct. And then those things will happen when his emotions just bubble up because he cares so much about what is about his players and his team and what is happening. Um, and it's rare to see it, but man, when it happens, like, you know, something special just happened <laughs> with, with his son, Brian, was he coaching there when you were there during that time? No, I didn't get the Brian years. Brian had, I think Brian was a senior, my freshman year, um, okay. off to, I think it was the Patriots, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. And uh, he came back after after I was already gone. Okay, he's quite the firecracker. He might he's a little different than his dad. He wears his emotions mm-hmm. on his sleeve a little bit more, which I do enjoy. I um, <laughs> I, I you know, not everyone is as big of a Brian Ferentz fan as I am. I I think he's awesome. I think he's a great guy. Uh, every time I've been down by the locker room after a game, he takes time out of out of his schedule to sit and talk to me and. He is just, I think, a first class dude. And, you know, we we get caught up, you know, complaining about the offense and, you know, but it's it's never been better since he's been <laughs> since he's been since running it. Speaking, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it stunk the first two games this last season. Like, we tried to turn it into an air raid with a brand-new quarterback who didn't even have spring ball under his belt. But, you know, other than that, like, you know, we got to remember, let's look at the let's look at the big picture. Like, Greg Davis didn't do so hot, you know. Like, you know, Ken O'Keefe, time to time, you know, was 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 all right. And, you know, he had some 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 bright spots, but I remember – most of the time as a fan being a little more frustrated than happy with both of those guys. And it's like, you got to look at the big picture here. Like he's doing pretty damn good compared to, you know, what we've had in the past. And, you know, we're not going to be an air raid offense, you know, we got to have balance, you know? Well, it feels so much more, I think, open um, than it has in the past. Like, and, and some of this, you listen to, you know, players talk about this thing or that thing who played in that era. Like, I didn't know Greg Davis, right? I didn't play under him. I didn't like him as an OC selection for us. But, uh, you know, understandably, his his playbook had more in it probably than was shown. Uh, right? um, you know, Kenny O's uh, playbook was pretty vanilla, but we were really, really good at the things that we did. Um, and that consistency bred confidence. That confidence led to success. Um, you know, Brian, like, that USC game, was just a that was a clinic on what this offense can be yeah uh, running passing you know the fly sweeps and uh you know downfield shots like everything was was clicking um in that game and uh and you just saw such a multitude of things uh, out of Iowa um you know including 17 yard QB sneaks or whatever the heck we you know we were running uh, you know that that sort of thing. You, I don't think you would have seen that in any other time during the Kirk Ferentz era. And it always makes me really excited about what we are 
capable of. Yeah. Uh, sort of offense should scare people, especially when you consistently have a top 10 defense, uh, you know, no matter what the offense looks like. Being a former player, what do you see as the succession plan for Kirk leaving? Uh, obviously, none of us have a crystal ball, so you know we're not going to carve this in stone and hold your feet to the fire on it or anything <laughs> like that. But you know, um, we really felt like there for a while uh, that Brian Ferentz was going to be our next head coach at some point, and that you know Kirk might only stick around for another two, three, four years. And really, at this point. I don't know that I see him going anywhere anytime soon. I want to hear your thoughts on how you see that transpiring. I'm really like, I'm as curious about it as anybody else because I'm kind of in that same boat. You know, Brian came back and it was kind of like, okay, here's, you know, coach the tight ends, you know, arguably the greatest tight end duo in, you know, Patriots history, won a couple of Super Bowls, came back to tight end you, uh, you know, coach. Uh, you know, the offensive line and, you know, see, you know, we have success there, but, you know, moving up the offensive coordinator and it's just kind of like, okay, this seems to be going a certain way, but now I'm just not so sure anymore. And I think it has a lot to do with who sticks around and who doesn't for the totality of Kirk's tenure. Yeah. Uh, God, I mean, Phil, uh, who uh, I can't believe nobody's tried to snatch him away for a head coach job somewhere. I know. Uh, which is absurd. Uh, LeVar, uh, you know, who uh, has everything that he has touched has turned to gold. Uh, Brian's coming into his own, but it's, you know, the offensive coordinator and the offensive mentality there. Uh, but then you can also go outside of the program and find some really, really high caliber, high quality uh, coaches, both at the college and NFL level, uh, with ties to either the state of or the program of Iowa. Um, and it's like, do you go outside of the program for this? Um, a lot of it, I think, will have to do with the state of the program when Kirk does finally decide to hang him up. Because nobody's, they're not kicking him out, right? He'll coach until, no. until he's ready to go. Um, and then I, I assume that by the time he will leave, when he feels comfortable leaving the program in somebody else's hands. It's guys that with him, when he said this one thing made me think like we might have a potential Joe Paterno situation that he said he lives for practice. That's what he loves is the grind of practice. And he looks so forward to that. And he can't imagine not going to practice every day. And when you answer something like that, that means that you're truly in it for the grind. You love the game. You love everything about what it's what it's truly about. And you know those those type of guys. I mean, those guys are gamers, and they stick mm -hmm. around because retirement is torture to a lot of those guys. And we might see him the the head coach for the next ten years. He's in great health. He looks great. You know, he's we're we're the program's in better shape than it's ever been. So I um. I always had the mindset, and this is just my my opinion. I thought, you know, Brian, you want you want to be the head coach. Okay. Why wouldn't you go take a job in like the Mac or something like that? A head coaching job. Prove yourself right. for four or five years, show some success, and you know, set that up with your, your dad. Like, you know, Kirk's like, okay, I'm gonna I'm I have a five-year plan, I'm out of here, and I'm gonna retire. If I'm Brian, I'm like, okay, well, if he, you know, they get the whole nepotism thing, like if he gets the job, you know, there's going to be people, no matter how good we do, that are going to say, well, it's just because he's, you know, Kirk's son. So I think he'd be able to hush a lot of the haters if he went to one of those, you know, like a Mac or a Mountain West or something like that mm -hmm. and, you know, took over a program and had success, then he's going to be ready, for, you know, a lot more openly welcomed for a power five job. What's your opinion on that? I think that's accurate. I think ultimately you have to take you have to take the names off. Um, you know, if you were to line up, uh, you know, the the top four candidates for the Iowa head coaching job when Kirk leaves, and you removed their names, and all you gave us was their uh, was their career statistics, right? What have they done? What have they accomplished? Where have they come from? Where have they coached? And you know, and what sort of success have, have they had there? Um, I think I think it's a no brainer. Uh, you know, I think that he's he has the pedigree in terms of his coaching experience to to do that. But I also think that that argument can be made for more than just Brian. Um, so, yes, you. So if so, when you actually add the names back in, then it is kind of a situation of like, OK, well, Phil and LeVar are kind of in the same boat. Phil's obviously been around, you know, longer. And with the success of the defense, you'd love to see, you know, that sort of mentality on the team as a whole. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, LeVar being, you know, kind of a younger guy, uh, you know, again, having the success that he has had in the positions uh, in the, uh, you know, being the special teams coordinator and whatnot, um, you know, that's kind of, is that more of a breath of fresh air because he's a little bit, you know, younger, but they still have the same ties to the program. If you go outside the program, do people like that? Is it popular to go, you know, the Iowa way is something that we really like take a lot of pride in. Yeah. And if somebody came in from the outside and did switch us to an air raid offense, right. And tried to do this and tried to do that and change things internally and bring in a whole new coaching staff, like would that be well received or not? Um, does it increase the the case for Brian if he goes somewhere else and comes back? I think so. Um, because yeah, then he goes to, to your point, like, you know, the, the Mac or something like that, um, and has a good amount of success, takes over a team and makes them, you know, conference champions or something like that. Then you can argue, okay, he has ties to the program and he has the pedigree, but also he's shown that he can, that these, these tactics from an Iowa perspective, from an Iowa guy have worked somewhere else. So then you have as much it's not it doesn't seem like the program has such a stranglehold on itself from the inside but you don't have the complete another 180 of bringing in somebody from the outside so i do think that would help this case uh, in that scenario that well said i complete i completely agree uh what one thing shifting gears here that i really want to know about too is your time in the arena football league now <laughs> it's like the quad the quad city is steam, steam wheelers is steam that what they was that? yeah what how did that come about I I thought I was done. I was pretty sure I was done playing football. I was going to be a coach, and that was going to be the end of it. Um, and uh, and the when they brought the steam wheelers back, I was pumped because I remember the steam wheelers from when I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we had this arena league here. We used to have all sorts of stuff. We had the Thunder, the Quad City Thunder basketball team, the steam wheelers, the Mallards for hockey and stuff. And so I was jacked about the wheelers coming back. And uh, and I got in touch. I forget how exactly, but with the owner of the team. Uh, and he was like, hey, do you want to come coach? I was like, oh, I'm coaching high school. I don't want to coach arena. I don't know anything about it. Um, he said, all right, well, do you want to come play? Uh, and I was like, "I there's no way. And I talked to my wife. She's like, no, you're not. <laughs> absolutely not. Um, and so every couple, of, every couple of weeks, he'd reach back out. Uh, Doug would reach back out and be like, hey, are you ready to go? You want to go yet? You starting to feel the itch? And... I did start to feel the itch, right? I was what, like a year out or something like that, a year or two out of out of plan. Um, and they got to the point where their center, good for him, got picked up by a CFL team. So that's kind of the thing, right? You play in the, in the arena league, you get a chance at the CFL, maybe the NFL someday. Like, why not? So he left, and they were they needed to win like two out of their last three games to make the playoffs. And they didn't really have a plan at backup center because your roster is like, you know, 20 people. So they, they, they asked again, and it was like, this time, this time it's not just, hey, do you want to? It's like, hey, we need you, was kind of the message. And I was like, oh, hometown, foot, like a real league football. Like, uh, all right, fine. Um, talked to my wife. She's like, okay, but just this once. And, uh, and yeah, I was out of shape. Hadn't done it in a while. Speaking of. But, <laughs> But I was, but she allowed me to do it, um, and I was very thankful for that. Um, and so we made it work. Uh, and yeah, we played four games. We won two out of the last three, um, and then we went down to uh, to Texas to play in our first playoff game and lost by like four points on the last second hail mary or something like that. That whole arena league is basically just a hail mary from one side of the field to the other at, uh, at that level. Um, but it was fun. It was a heck of a lot of fun. I don't regret it for one second. I, I've been to a few of those games. I grew up in Des Moines, so I used to go to the Barnstormers games all the time. And oh, yeah. They're fun. They're a good time. And it, it it's definitely nice to go to that when, you know, the regular football is not available. And yeah. you have that. It's a great alternative. And that's why I was super happy that the XFL – was relaunched because I'm like I want some football in uh, in the summer and then especially with the FCS you know a lot of those teams playing a spring schedule do mm -hmm. you think that's going to stick I think that's an awesome idea because you know during this whole time you know you got a team like Jackson State and you got Deion Sanders on the sidelines with a gold it's chain awesome. yeah which is awesome <laughs> I love that I've watched it first time I've ever watched a Jackson State game in my life but mm -hmm. you know it's like it's spring 
And, you know, in, in our society, we're going to watch every bit of football we possibly can. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, from about January through August, I struggle because I need, I, I, <laughs> I, I love football. I need it. And to know that the, you know, XFL, I don't even know if the XFL is going to play this summer or if it's later. I'm not sure about that. But do you think the FCS thing in the spring, do you think that's going to stick? I don't know if it's going to stick. Um, football is like, it's weird. I knew it was happening in the spring, and I still never really watched because I was so I wasn't used to it. Yeah, so, to see like how that affected attendance. How well I mean, Corona apocalypse going on. There's you know there's more affecting attendance than just schedule. Yeah, but TV ratings. You know, like do they do they get twice as much TV reading to air TV ratings as well because there's no football, uh, but not because there's no football because there's you know because it's a different season for football and there's no uh, competition. Um, you know, they're not playing with the FBS guys. They're not playing with the, with the NFL guys. Uh, football year round sounds awesome. Also sounds a little bit exhausting. Yeah. Uh, at the same time. Yeah. If you split it up and you had, you know, your FCS season and your XFL, CFL season, and then your, you know, your NCAA and your NFL season, like I would be for it. I would definitely, I'd be all about it. I've already claimed the those the the St. Louis uh, Battlehawks as uh, as my XFL team. Um, yeah. so pumped about that, but it seems really, it seems like a cool, like a cool idea. I just, I don't know if it'll stick. I'm, I'm, I'm not sold on it as that being the norm. I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. I don't think it'll probably mm-hmm. stick, but I. I would love it if it did. And yeah, that's funny you said that because I got online and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a St. Louis Battlehawks fan because, you know, Chuck Long's there and they got some Iowa guys there. So I'm like, that's who I'm going to get behind. And I get online and they have like two t shirts and a hat you can choose from and they're all sold out. I'm <laughs> like, well, see you later. I'm not going to be buying any St. Louis Battlehawks <laughs> stuff right now. So looks like I'm buying another Hawkeye t shirt. So, uh, it's I'm hoping that we at least get to see a little bit of XFL football this summer because still it's it's fun to watch and it, it'd be a really nice minor league to the NFL. Um, yeah. I would oh somebody in trouble. No, it's bedtime for the kids. So oh, okay, we'll we'll wrap it up here in a sec so you can help <laughs> help put the kids to bed. But talk a little bit about your uh, your music career our music career that you have going on because um, we posted today um, one of your one of your band singles and. I really, really enjoyed it. I the sound was amazing, and I, I told you I listened to it like three or four times today. And I, I was I wasn't lying. My kids were like, "You're listening to that song again," and I'm like, "I told my kids, I'm like this this, this guy that's singing is a former Iowa football player," and they're like, "Seriously?" And so then they were they were involved. Then they wanted to hear it. So tell us what you have going on. Oh, uh, right, right now it's kind of it's this weird area where. Uh, so we are, as a band, we've actually broken up, which is insane. So the whole thing, we, we, we played uh, for five years. And it was the five years that I was in the league during the offseason. I would come home and we had this band and we would play locally, um, you know, and, and do just kind of some, I guess you call it local touring, not really touring. Uh, and, and so we were, we were never really able to get anything consistent going. But we ended up winning uh, a local battle of the bands. And we won uh, recording time with uh, Jose Urquiza, who is the lead singer of Three Years Hollow, who's like the biggest band to make it out of our area in decades since like Lynn Allen. Yeah. Uh, and he has a recording studio in Geneseo. So we went out and we recorded, uh, I think we got like three songs free. So we recorded those three songs. Uh, and then he was like, I really like your sound. Like, is this kind of, you know, is this kind of it? What's the plan for you guys? And we're like, you know, we have a bunch of them. Like, we could do more. Uh, and so we kind of, we would play shows to scrounge together the money to pay him to record the rest of this album because we really just wanted an album. And we got to the point where it was fully recorded. Uh, and then we had this uh, this split in the band, um, you know. And so it's been four years, I think, since we, since we played a live show. Uh, and we've just kind of been tweaking this album little bit by little bit. Um, and we're finally, we got the mixes done and we're getting the masters done. Uh, and you know, as much as I would love to, to kind of play live again, cause I miss that tremendously. I'm a huge karaoke buff. A lot of people still remember the story of Iowa with the Alamo bowl and me singing opera for the, you know, the Texas team and all this other stuff. And that was awesome. Which was, which was a ton of fun. And I still, you know, I, I get some clout for that, which is great. But the, um, 
but like as far as like music stuff goes like i miss that so much uh you know yeah. stage and uh you know and performing and kind of hamming it up and getting to be a part of a band and uh, you know and, and going out and uh, and doing live music was so awesome um and so i miss it tremendously uh but this album is kind of the culmination uh of that passion which was a huge part of my life for those you know five six years that we were that we were uh, playing live and then working on this album um you know outside of football the the band kind of consumed my time um and uh and i loved every minute of it so the yeah the song that i sent you will uh it was the only one that we wrote in the studio so it'll never be played live which is uh, which is a bit sad but uh you know it's it's been an awesome ride just to be a part of that um and if you talk about like you know life being made up of experiences like that's something that i'll never that i'll never uh you know uh regret is uh is you know that battle of the bands especially i mean packing you know just a, even just a local bar but packing a local bar with people and the lights and the smoke machine and the sounds and you know and people reaching up onto the stage and everything and it was you know five guys just kicking ass for you know two hours like it was such an awesome experience um you know so i'm really really excited to, to have this thing uh, this, you know this content coming out this music so that other people can kind of uh, you know hear a little bit of what we had to experience what we got to be a part of for those years yeah and especially with the pandemic and everything it's just that type of experience you just miss it so much yep. and just going to a live show, all these little things that you took for granted, even, you know, just going to a bar and having some drinks with some friends, you know, things like that, that you just, you miss completely. Do you, do you feel like there's any sort of like, you know, long shot that, you know, th this thing gets out there and starts to gain a little steam that you guys might play any more shows? Or is that something that like that ship has sailed? I think, I think for that band, that ship has sailed. Um, you know, there's some pieces there that are, that are kind of broken that I don't think could be repaired. Um, but uh you know three of us are still very close um you know we still talk we we're the ones who kind of drove the the, the finishing of this of this album and we've spoken before about potentially uh you know doing something new um you know i i don't think i think that what we had with the band is bigger on the inside what we had there which is a dr Hugh joke because we're all huge nerds so what we had there was something special and i don't want to try and replicate it ever yeah before. um but uh but to be a part of something new uh, and have the opportunity to, you know, to get up on stage and perform again, I would, I would take that in a heartbeat. My wife would absolutely murder me in my sleep because I do not have time for it between the kids and my work and Highland games and her and all this other stuff that we're doing. But, um, but I miss it enough that I would probably take it <laughs> take a chance uh, at, uh, you know, take my life into my own hands and give it another shot. I need to know about this Highland Games because that was the thing I was going to close with and, and ask you. <laughs> yeah. It looks pretty awesome. Tell me how you got started doing that. And, you know, for everyone out there that hasn't seen it or watched it, I saw you have a like a black and gold kilt that you wear, which oh, yeah. is freaking cool. I want one. That is <laughs> badass. Uh, tell everybody out there how they can watch you do this crazy stuff and what all the games are. Sure. So the I'm uh, part of my heritage is Welsh. Um, right, I'm Dutch, Welsh, African, uh, German, and there's something else in there. But uh, the You've got a little the, everything. There's a little. There's a little bit of a lot of things going on here. Um, That's awesome. On my on my mom's side, um, in my in my grandmother's family is the Welsh background, um, and so it's not exactly Scottish, right? But the Highland Games are Scottish, ancient Scottish tests of manhood and strength, and a lot of them are the precursors to Olympic events so like the scottish hammer is a precursor to our current our modern day um you know uh, like olympic hammer throw um the stone throws the the open and the braemar stone are precursors to the shot put so there's some there's some some correlations there um and i was a two-time state champion shot putter so i was like when i i i was interested my last year my, the year before my last year in the nfl i really started to get into this so i started to kind of get into my welsh heritage and, and i knew that the island games were a thing um, and I had a, a friend who I had met um, here locally in the Quad Cities who was part of a Highland Games club, sort of a throwing club that we had here. Um, so I went to him and we kind of did, uh, you know, he showed me, you know, some of the exercises and stuff or some of the events. There's nine events. Um, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I got called back out to Philly. So then I did the dance in Philly that last year, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then at, when I came back, I said, all right, well, I don't, 
I don't really want to do like traditional workouts, right? I've been lifting weights my whole life. And I don't know if I'm ever going back to the NFL. Like this seems like something I could really get into. Right? It's, a, it's an explosive strength athletic event. Um, and so I started to dig into it and got just, I mean, I fell down a rabbit hole as far as, uh, as far as what it is. So, um, you know, you've got nine events, you've got the two stones, which are basically a, a super heavy shot put and then a, and then a lighter one. Uh, and then you've got weight for distance where you're taking like a, you know, a 28 or a 56 pound weight on a chain and you spin it around your body and you have to move uh, through a trig as you're uh, doing it. And then you throw that the hammer, which is like Olympic hammer, but you're stationary. So you stand in one place you got a weight on the pole and uh, you swing that around. The ones that everybody kind of knows because they're the more famous ones, uh, the caber toss is the big one. Right, so that's the telephone pole. You basically take a big telephone pole and you try and flip it end over end. Um, that's crazy. So that one's fun. Uh, the sheaf toss where you, you have a, a bag filled with twine and you stab it with a pitchfork and you try and throw it like 30 feet up over a bar. Um, and the weight over bar, you take a 56 pound weight, you throw it over your head and you try and clear a bar with it. So these nine events make up the, the traditional Scottish Highland games. And we, there are contests for this all over the country, all over the world. I got invited to Japan to throw Highland games at an army base in Japan. Uh, was just a culmination of, oh my gosh, that was the best 10 days of my life until my wife said that. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was the most insane experience. But these, uh, if you YouTube me on, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the first thing that comes up now. So ESPN came and did like an expose after I had been released from the NFL for the last time uh, on me throwing Highland games. And so that's up on, on YouTube if you want like a precursor to kind of how yeah. it goes. Um, but it's super fun. It's super laid back. Uh, you know, everyone who does it uh, is, is you know, for the most part, they're just awesome people, uh, you know, out having a good time, drinking, eating, throwing heavy things around, you know, uh, giving each other shit left and right. Uh, you know, you wear a kilt, you go to cultural festivals, they do these at fairs and cultural festivals and, uh, you know, in medieval times, you know, sort of like Renaissance fairs and stuff like that. Uh, so you get to go to these awesome events and, you know, spend your day doing something that to me is, is personally and culturally fulfilling uh, and enjoying the, the, the whole atmosphere of the day. It's just, a, it's awesome. So that is like my, my, my number one hobby right now that I do. If I'm not working or with my family, I'm doing something to, to better myself for Highland games, whether it's lifting or practicing or buying a new kilt. That's uh, way manlier than anything I've ever done before. So <laughs> you can uh, try it though; it's great. There's different classes. There's like there's lightweights for if you're for if you're just a little guy. They they throw smaller weights. There's okay. C class, A class, super A's. There's actually professionals who do travel worldwide and uh, and make a halfway decent living. Uh, I mean, that's that's such a you know masculine manly thing. I mean, the wife's got to look at you and be like, "Damn, Julian, you're a stud." <laughs> she does love it. There's not a lot of things. Like, yeah, she, you know, when I go sleeveless and start, you know, uh, flipping telephone poles, um, she's a big fan. There you go. Mama gets fired up to see her, <laughs> see her hubby out doing that stuff. Like, not too many husbands can do that. So <laughs> that's right, yeah. she's like, that's my guy right there. The freaking <laughs> quad city lumberjack throwing stuff around. <laughs> That's pretty badass, man. That's so cool. Um, I'm definitely going to get on and check out those YouTube videos. And do you want to let everyone know that is watching right now, if they want to check out your band's album, um, when that is going to be available, what the name of it is, and where they can find it? Sure. So I don't even know when it's going to be fully available. Um, right now, the final tracks are being mastered. There's 12 of them total. Um, so it's the band's name is bigger on the inside. Uh, the uh, the first track that we released, which will be the, the title track of the album, is Ghosts in the Hallway. Uh, and so that'll be, eventually, we'll put it up on Spotify. Uh, we kind of have a plan for that, but it won't be in place for uh, for a little while yet. So, um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a cool thing, but it's just so fluid. Because without really, a you know, we're not touring, so it's not like there's a big rush to get this yeah. thing, like, build hype before a summer tour or anything like that. So... We're just kind of, we're, we're taking it easy and we're going, listen, we want to have, since this is the only like, you know, remnant of we're going to have in this band, we want it to be perfect. So we're really like taking our time with it. 
it's not one of those typical things where somebody that you know reaches out and is like, "Oh, I got this band. You should listen to this." And you listen to it, and you're like, "Oh, shit, this is garbage." <laughs> but you don't want to tell your friend that it sucks because you know they, they you care about them. You don't want to hurt their feelings. Like you know, this is legitimately like good music. Like I would, I, I, I was listening to it, and I'm like, I could hear this on Alt Nation, like on Sirius XM or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm like, it, it's really quality stuff. So if you're end of any kind of like alternative rock or rock in general you, you need to check it out because um we posted it on our facebook page like i said so if anyone wants to listen to that song which i'm probably going to listen to at least one more time tonight it's a jam <laughs> i i love it uh we uh you, you won't be disappointed so but again thank you so much for taking time to uh, sit down and talk with us on Nebraska Hawks Nest. I know the kids and the family are upstairs waiting for you, and you gotta you gotta tend to those responsibilities. I have the same weight for me too, so I need to get rolling too, man. Oh well, boy, we better get up there before we're both sleeping on the couch tonight. I know, right? Man, I had a blast <laughs> talking to you, dude. You're a lot of fun. We're gonna have to do this again sometime because this is. Uh, <laughs> I, you're one of the most fun people I've had to talk to. You're extremely well spoken, and you are not a boring interview, that's for sure. Well, thank you very much. I, I've really enjoyed being here, so thank you so much. All right, man. We'll be reaching back out. We're going to do something again soon, okay? Heck yeah. All right, Julian. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Woo! Woo!